I am Elizabeth Sidman Aristoff. I am an artist and a member of the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies Advisory Committee. It is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speakers today at Yale for this wonderful event, The Art of Nature and the Nature of Art, Exploring the Reunion of Arts and Biodiversity Sciences. Today, we hope to explore the connection between the two areas of human inquiry that arise from the same source, the desire, the wish to make sense of and understand the world around us. But these two have drifted apart, so much so that their individual vocabularies have become nearly foreign to one another. This symposium arose from a desire to reintegrate and reinvigorate art and science. Our speakers come from a variety of disciplines. We have with us artists, art historians, biologists, but all of these have a shared love of both art and science and the wellspring that inspires us to be inquisitive, which is nature. Our first speakers are Amy Myers and Robert Peck. Amy Myers, director of the Yale Center of British Art, has written extensively about natural history and art. Her books include Mark Catesby's New World Vision and the recently released Knowing About Nature. Yep. <laughs> Knowing Nature, wonderful, wonderful book. Um, it's Art and Science in Philadelphia, 1740 to 1840, a project she began as curator of American art at the Huntington Library in California and continued at Yale. It's a truly beautiful book. Robert Peck is a curator of arts and artifacts and senior fellow at the uh, Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. He is a writer, a naturalist, historian, and world traveler. Bob recently published a monumental book on the history of the Academy of Natural Science. <laughs> I have to feel like an ad. Everybody, this is an amazing book again. Um, it is a, sorry, a celebration of the Academy's 200th anniversary. He is currently working on a book and exhibition about the parrot paintings of Edward Lear. Please welcome Amy and, sorry, and Robert. Come on. Just give me a moment, Tim. Thank you so much, Liz. And um, may I just say that as the director of another unit at Yale, I am so delighted to be part of this program today. Um, I should note just before I begin that I did my doctoral work here at Yale many, many decades ago as an American Studies PhD. And really, it's out of that work too many years ago than I can say, that this project, um, about which I'll say just a few words today, um, began. But I couldn't have imagined a center like this, which would bring us all together in the extraordinary way that you are. And I hope that this presages a really remarkable set of cross-disciplinary discussions. I think that um, this center and the Center for, uh, the Frankie Center for Science um, and the Humanities at Yale are natural partners, but we at the Yale Center for British Art hope that we'll be able to partner um, with you as well on many projects into the future. So thank you for including me, and thank you for your kind words, Liz. Over the course of the 18th century, the relatively open and permissive intellectual society of Quaker Philadelphia, the largest and wealthiest metropolis of the British colonies in the transatlantic world, fostered an especially keen receptiveness to the new science, and as the sociologist Digby Baltzell has written, brought the Enlightenment to America. I hope there are no Bostonians sitting in this audience. <laughs> The culture of science that developed in this major intellectual hub of the colonial world and that extended ultimately into the 19th century and beyond is the focus of the two books that Bob Peck and I have edited recently. In Bob's case, A Glorious Enterprise, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia and the Making of American Science, the magnificent publication accompanying a rich series of exhibitions and programs celebrating the Academy's 200th anniversary mounted over the course of this year. 
and in mine, Knowing Nature, Art and Science in Philadelphia, 1740 to 1840, a set of 14 essays by a range of distinguished art historians, social and political historians, and historians of science that offer a dynamic picture of how the visual and material interpretation of the natural world functioned not only in, um, in colonial and early Republican science, but across the culture of the period more generally. As close collegial friends, Bob and I have been working together on these topics for over for 30 years. I met Bob when I was working on my dissertation here, so that was a long time ago. Indeed, Bob authored an essay in my book, and so we are delighted, indeed honored, to introduce you to our related projects together this afternoon. I will begin our joint presentation with a brief overview of the wide-ranging subjects covered in Knowing Nature, after which Bob will discuss his own publication and the academy programs to which it speaks. The essays that comprise Knowing Nature elucidate a mu multiplicity of ways in which a pervasive interest in nature, fostered in Philadelphia for spiritual, aesthetic, economic, and political ends, affected those processes of making traditionally associated with scientific practice of the day, such as the crafting of cabinets of curiosity, menageries, botanic gardens, and images of natural productions. And of the limitless examples I might have chosen, I show you here a drawing of the garden of the botanist John Bartram, my his son William, in, um, which was executed in 1758, and plate 35 in volume four of Alexander Wilson's American Ornithology, or the Natural History of Birds in the United States, published in Philadelphia between 1808 and, and 1814. A radical Scottish weaver who emigrated to North America and supported himself as a school teacher, Wilson was mentored as a naturalist artist by William Bartram in the family's garden and was encouraged by William to produce the first illustrated book on North American birds to be published on this continent. And I know the subject is deeply meaningful to us here at Yale, so I thought that you might want to see what those first images might have looked like. While examining the plethora of materials produced directly in conversation um, with science, indeed often self-consciously in its service, knowing nature also charts those activities not ordinarily linked to scientific practice that involve the close study of nature. From the design and production of textiles and garments, decorative arts objects, domestic and institutional interiors, and architectural structures to the mapping of land and the reshaping of its contours through agricultural production, and again, of the infinite numbers of objects and images that might be shown as examples. Um, I show you here objects that resulted from such close observations of the natural world. One of the first pieces of American soft porcelain pastry, a pickle stand decorated with small shells cast from real mollusks by um, Gus Bonham and Anthony uh, George Anthony Morris in Philadelphia in the first years of the 1770s. We can't date the stand exactly, but these little shells that you see along the stem were actually collected, studied, and then cast as part of the larger image, which would have connoted hospitality and gener generosity in the form of the scallop shells, which then have an iconographic importance and also a bed cover from about 1800 made from floral fabrics that were um, based on studies of the natural world, birds and flowers, that were block printed by the fabric producer John Hewson, an astute study of nature in his own right. The often surprisingly intimate connections between and among those observing nature directly in the service of science and those doing so for other ends are examined closely through the essays in this book, calling into question the hierarchy that is generally assumed to have been at play in the study of the natural world, from the natural sciences through the fine and decorative arts and ultimately through popular and material culture. Indeed, the many ways in which the process of coming to know nature was essentially reversed, in which artistic and artisanal culture informed scientific interpretations of the natural world might be considered a central theme of the book. The general supposition that science was the province of gentlemen alone 
is also challenged, and how artists and craftspeople with their special knowledge of natural materials came into conversation with those investigating nature for theoretical and practical purposes of science is explored from many vantage points. On the screen, for example, you see an image of the exhumation of the mastodon, painted between 1806 and 1808 by the Philadelphia artist and museum director, Charles Wilson Peel, to whom the Peabody, of course, owes a great debt, um, to celebrate the success of the partially mechanized system that Peel developed to extract from the grounds of a farm in Shawagunk, New York, the bones of three mastodons from which he would construct the first complete skeleton of the beast ever assembled. Peel shows in this work the entire range of workers invested in this heroic challenge, from the day laborers operating the machine and extracting the bones from the pit, through family members and scientific colleagues helping him to direct the process and to conceptualize the skeleton through the art of drawing. And you can see Peel holding his great drawing that symbolically attaches two of the bones through which he's worked out this process um, that's held up by various family members who are part of his team, so to speak. So this is very much about communal and cross-disciplinary enterprise which involves a vast array of people and their professions, not simply academy-trained sa scientists. Um, and it's just, of course, at the time when specialization is emerging and Philadelphia is becoming a real center of specialized science. But Peel won't let you forget that that science can't be done without a very intimately um, linked and vast array of specialists, each in their own right, contributing to the process. In short, Knowing Nature presents a group of case studies that upset the traditional hierarchical view of the production of knowledge, which dictates that science informs art, a hierarchical view that has hindered a clear understanding of how analytical approaches to the natural world developed during the 18th and early 19th centuries. In so doing, these case studies place central importance on creative processes and object types not usually considered as relevant to the history of science. At the same time, these examinations also explore the ways in which those creative processes and object types, which customarily have been associated exclusively with scientific practice, actually functioned in many cultural arenas. You're looking at my favorite drawing. Focused analyses illustrate, for example, that objects which naturalists seem to have crafted solely for the purposes of science often served as social commentary or autobiographical reflection, evidencing both the self-conscious interest taken by naturalists who made them in the overlapping communities of which they were a part and their own roles in these various spheres. And I show you here a particularly powerful instance of this, a botanical drawing by William Bartram made in 1796 to illustrate one of his new discoveries from New the New Jersey side of the Delaware River, an orchid he called Arethusa de Vericata. Yet the image is far more than a scientific illustration intended to define the attributes of the species. And you can see this very tall orchid, which he um, causes to stretch across the whole of the paper vertically, but there's so much more that's going on in this image. Along with the date of the drawing and his signature of artist, Bartram inscribed his venerable age, then of 56 years old, explicitly marking the moment when he portrayed his new find in the history of his own career. Indeed, he shows the specimen as growing from a great piece of turf including other notable discoveries from across much of his, that distinguished career, going back to the Tippity Witchet or the Venus flytrap, of which he made the first drawing while visiting his uncle on the Cape Fear River in North Carolina from 1761 to 1762. And if you look at the base of the Arethusa, just run your eye down, you'll see um, a sundew at the very bottom and just your eye travels left and you'll see the Venus flytrap with its open trap on the very far ha left hand um, bottom um, part of the drawing. 
That drawing, the one that he made in the 1760s to illustrate the Tippity Witchet, and the seeds and specimens he collected had been sent by his father John to his English colleagues, among whom the plant, described by Linnaeus as miraculum nature, would cause a sensation. Now many decades later, in his drawing of Arethusa from the late 1790s, William poses the specimen and its forebearers in his pantheon of plant discoveries against the city of Philadelphia, which had matured into a major international um, metropolis in tandem with the growth of the Bartram Zone Garden, creating an autobiographical work that meshes the history of the city into which he and his family were inscribed so significantly as naturalists. Indeed, as many of the essays that constitute Knowing Nature demonstrate, during this critical period of the development of North American science, as the United States emerged as a young republic, many Philadelphia naturalists, as members of the leading scientific community of the transatlantic world, thought seriously about their communal ties locally, regionally, and internationally, taking into consideration a complex of major factors, a real matrix, including national origin, ethnicity, race, gender, regional, um, at political affiliation, religion, economic interests, and class, and meshing these into their analysis of the, national, of the natural world. Such considerations surface frequently in their work, helping us to understand how these early investigators bound themselves to some communities and distinguished themselves from others, created a, creating a complicated, indeed kaleidoscopic world of complementary and competing interests in the natural productions of North America. These meditations on self-definition and communal affiliation form a, cr a critical strand that runs through the essays that constitute knowing nature, charting a century of monumental changes during which time Philadelphia shifted in status from the largest and most affluent colonial city of British North America and of the British Empire, of course, to the capital of the New Republic, and finally to one of several competing centers of political, social, and cultural influence. These examinations demonstrate how the study of the material and artistic culture of science can illuminate much broader societal attitudes and trends. Indeed, neither as definitive nor as comprehensive, this collection of essays points the way to further cross-disciplinary studies in which objects made to promote an understanding of nature can be seen to reflect the aspirations and anxieties, the successes and failures of the larger cultures of which they were a part. And of course, we will hope that this center and those across Yale that unite this cross-disciplinary pursuit will help us forward in our understanding of this complex intellectual matrix um, that begins to be discussed in this book. By way of reflection, I leave you here with an image of Charles Wilson Peale um, standing in his um, great museum as he depicted himself in 1822, thinking hard about his role and the many communities of which he of course, was a part, as well as those to whom he would introduce these communities through the museum as a site of learning. Um, and we, of course, have several of those major sites of like kinds at Yale, the Peabody being first and foremost. Bob will say a few more words about this image as he talks about the Academy of Natural Sciences. So I'm delighted to hand over the podium to Bob. Thank you.